Okay, let's start. Okay, let's uh, start. It's with great pleasure that uh, we have Radu Sion here. Uh, Radu is a professor in Stony Brook. You don't have to do this. Uh, I knew Radu for so many years. We graduated together from uh, Purdue uh, very, uh, very early uh, in 2004 or so. He graduated 2003. No. 2004. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Radu has been shifting from databases to security. Uh, in the last few years and became a really big uh, influencer in the security community and uh, I was surprised that, uh, that he abandoned databases um, that easily, but he's going back and forth. So he's still publishing VLDB and multiple uh, database venues and uh, recently Radu is wearing the t-shirt of his own company, Private Machines, uh, a new startup of New York and doing really well as I heard. So um, um, we're... <laughs> Looking forward to, I don't know what title he's going to talk about today because he keeps changing and he just customized this for us by having one of the teams. He just typed it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's great to have him here and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and yes, we do have money in the startup, enough money to, to print t shirts. <laughs> so that should tell you. Um, so, uh, the thing is, this, I'm mainly doing security these days uh, for quite a few years now. And uh, however, I, I, you know, as the help mentioned, I had done some database stuff a long time ago. And in the meantime, I've been publishing in Sigma, VLDB, ICD, and so on. So today it was a little challenging to figure out what to talk about. So uh, especially since I don't really know how to give good talks. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw at you a bunch of things I've been working on in the past year. Uh, there's going to be about five decks of slides. I, prom I hate people, they stay over. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish in exactly one hour. That's the plan. Um, I want to make this a conversation. So just interrupt me at any point in time. I don't care about going through all this stuff. Let's just have a little chat. And so we'll have five different sections of this chat on five different topics. And I've Frankly, I've done this uh, just recently somewhere else, and it worked, kind of. Uh, not all the five, but uh, anyway. So let's hope this thing works, OK? So the first thing is something that some of you may have seen before, especially Jan. And um, so this is uh, to cloud or not to cloud. This is a talk that at some point was about five hours, and now it's going to be compressed in 10 minutes. And the question I'm asking here is, OK, well, cloud computing, by now I don't, we don't have to discuss what clouds are. Everybody knows what clouds are and so on. And so the question I'm going to ask here is, hey, man, is it worth it to, to go to the cloud? OK, uh, is it? I'm, I, <laughs> is it <laughs> yeah, so uh, is it worth it to go to the cloud? Well, no, I want to make this more interesting. I mean, I could talk, I could give you one technical talk. It's going to be boring. I'm going to go on there. Half of you will leave. Or we could do this. Let's try this. So is it worth, so, so we have a bunch of costs and a bunch of benefits. And some of these costs we can quantify, and some of these benefits we can maybe also quantify. And we're trying to understand whether it's worth it to take one CPU cycle from my home machine and put it in the cloud and run it there. This is one thing we, we, can, we can talk about. So this is going to be the first 10 minutes of this talk. We're going to try to answer this question in some sort of meaningful way that allows us to keep outside of the, you know, our discussion sphere all the people that will say, well, I'm going to the cloud because I'm the CEO of a company and I golf with my buddy who runs a cloud startup. Uh, so we're trying to look at some quantifiable uh, things. And the quantifiable things that I know about are dollars, dollars per megabyte per year, dollars per CPU cycle, dollars per networking bit. You're paying for apps. Quantifying functionality and how much you're willing to pay, that's an excellent point. So the, the point is, and I was told I have to repeat the question, so the point was, you're paying for apps. And so, quanti so I, I, su I suspect what you're suggesting is that, hey, man, I'm, I'm paying for this new functionality that somebody built for me, and I'm not paying so much for the compute cycles or cheaper this or that or that, but rather all kinds of cool functionality. And that's an excellent point. I just don't know how to quantify that. And that's very application specific. So instead of doing that, I will, I will boil things down. I will normalize to something that I understand, which is how much does it cost me to store one bit per year active at a certain latency guarantees? How much does it cost me to, turn, to, to add 264-bit numbers? 
how much does it cost me to send one bit over a fiber into this cloud where my application or data resides? These are the things I understand and I can easily quantify. All these other application specific things like, hey, I have this cool app that I really love and nobody else has it. I can't buy it. It runs in the cloud. I'm going to have to use it. This stuff I don't know how to quantify right now. I don't have a cost model for that. And that, that may, be well, may well be the reason why you go to the cloud. But for now, I'm going to ignore that in blissful ignorance. But that's an excellent point. So, um, and since we have to compress all this thing in, in, in 10 minutes, basically what I'm going to try to tell you is that there's a lot of components to these costs. And we have hardware, energy, people, service, space, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, size does matter, right? If you're a small company, if you're a large company, or you're a Wall Street cloud that runs 150,000 cores, you know, Bank of America, for example, Merrill runs about 160,000 cores in-house, they are as big as a moderately sized cloud already. So when you, when you talk about, is it worth it to go to the cloud? Well, for Merrill, it may be less worth it than for a small business, and so on and so forth. So we're looking across this entire scale. And so the first question we're going to ask, and by the way, clouds have all kinds of cool things that we don't have time to talk about, like custom hardware, efficient cooling, load shifting, high CPU utilization, high power usage efficiency, and so on and so forth. And so what we're trying to understand is, what is the cost of a CPU cycle? The first thing we're going to talk about. And bear with me, all these five things will come together at some point at the end, okay? So this is, this is going to sound a little shallow, all this stuff, because we don't get into details. But I think the, the bottom line and the final discourse of the whole day will be coming back together. So, so what is the story of the, okay, so what is the cost of a CPU cycle? And we've been doing this for a long time, and this is numbers of 2009. Well, it turns out that in the cloud, it costs you less than half a picocent, 10 to the minus 14 US dollars to add two 64-bit numbers. And at home, or in, actually in a small business, it costs you tens of picocents to add two 64-bit numbers. All right, so it seems like I'm saving quite a bit, one or two orders of magnitude, by adding my numbers in the cloud as opposed to adding them at home. So that's one first data point. So, um, and oh, by the way, what do people charge? Well, this was also 2009, but the numbers have not, they're basically half, the numbers are half now. Um, what do people charge? Well, this is what Google charges. These are also picocents. So we're not, the, the other numbers we had were for, coming from an analytical model, but the numbers validate very well with the cost models that you have right now, the pricing models that, uh, that the clouds offer. And oh, by the way, Rackspace is much, much cheaper than Amazon. And oh, by the way, one more cool thing here. Service is the least important part of this CPU cycle chunk. If you want to save money in the cloud, you either do energy efficient algorithms or, or something to, to, to deal with energy efficiency, or you build better server hardware that amortize acquisition costs with much better amortized acquisition costs. So these are the two pressure points uh, at scale. You don't have service and all these other things don't count as much. So is it worth it to go to the cloud? And the answer seems to be that yes, because I'm saving a lot and I'm, you know, I, I have an opportunity to save a lot. Don't forget that, please, especially grad students, just give me a hard time, just interrupt me, let's have some conversation. Yes, sir, yes, so, I'm excited. Uh, you pointed out that uh, home computers have a hate contention to CPU cycle. If I want to add two numbers to my home computer, why can't I use home computers non-stress? I have to apologize, I didn't, I didn't hear half of your question. So at a home computer have low utilization, you mentioned? Or? Yes. So you're getting to a very important point. What, you, what I think you, what your question ultimately boils down to is understanding the impact of utilization and the ultimate cost of a cycle. And basically the argument for the home cycle being more expensive, part of that, a small part but still a part of that, is the fact that at home, since I have few cycles to, uh, to do per unit of absolute time, these cycles will become more expensive because I have to buy this hardware and I'm gonna power this hardware up and the hardware will live at 5% utilization or 10% utilization on, on average. So the cycles become more expensive because I have to amortize all these other things even though I don't have a lot of stuff to do. I can't just take one cycle 
run it and then shut down my computer and suddenly magically disappear the, amort uh, the amortized acquisition cost in the energy. Whereas if I do this cycle in the cloud, I can turn off, I pay only for that cycle. I can turn it off as soon as I don't need it anymore. Um, I'm not sure if this answers exactly your question, uh, but it answers some question that I, I created for myself in my head that was very easy for me to answer. <laughs> let's, let's take it offline a little bit if, if that didn't answer. But don't hesitate to ask more questions. Um, all right, so is it worth it? More questions? Yes? No? Well, OK. What we did is we forget about the tubes. As we all know, the internet is a series of tubes. And as we put things in these tubes, as some famous senator once said in the US, as we put things in these tubes, things start to cost. So we're far from this cloud, so we have to pay. We have to pay to push these bits across this fiber. And the question is, how much do we have to pay? Well, it turns out we have to pay thousands of picocents, thousands and thousands of picocents per one bit. Just to push one bit from a home machine into a cloud, I'll have to pay thousands of picocents. So now I'm saving a few tens of picocents per 64-bit addition. But just to bring one bit there is going to cost me thousands of picocents. So just, uh, oh, and by the way, do we have additional ammunition? That's it? We're done? Oh, this thing. Cables. Cables. All right, I'm going to skip over this. So, um, so should I buy a piece of the sky? Well, it turns out that not always, right? Because I have to deal with this transferring of data. And so we come up with this very fancy first thing, and we call the principle of cloud viability, because we want to give ourselves the illusion that we do important research. And so this principle says, hey, man, don't outsource anything unless it's compute intensive enough. In this case, you do at least 4,000 CPU cycles per transfer 32-bit input. This is roughly that ballpark where you're at. That's the border. That's the, this is the threshold that you have to cross to make it worth to go to the cloud. If you don't do this much computation, bringing the data to this cheaper compute ability is, is just not worth it. Any questions? So you're assuming that the data doesn't live on the cloud? Excellent, excellent. Thank you. This is an excellent point. So, um, Oh, but before we move there, and that's an excellent point, but, but before we move there, why should any such conclusions hold? And this is important. Even though what, you're correctly noting that whatever I said so far is bullshit, it's actually not holding, it's a lie. But before we move forward, if it were to be true, why would it hold for the foreseeable future on von Neumann machines? Well, because we have a ratio of exponentials, and the ratio of exponentials is exponential. And the two exponentials are Moore and Nielsen's law. Moore, Moore's law, we all know. And then Nielsen's law talks about speeds of networks, network speeds. And it basically says high-end connection speeds grow 50% per year. Price goes proportionally down accordingly. So now we have these two things. We have Moore's law that goes up. And then we have Nielsen that goes also up, but not as at, at, at such a high slope. So what, what does this mean? Well, it means over time, my opportunity, my differential in savings of CPU cycles becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because the absolute values become smaller. My compute at home becomes more ex more, uh, cheaper. My compute in the cloud becomes cheaper. But now then the differential between the two becomes also smaller. Whereas uh, the networking doesn't have an opportunity to go down as fast as, as Moore's law. So my networking will go down, but not as fast as Moore's law. So my opportunity for saving from CPU cycles diminishes. But my opportunity for my network costs don't diminish accordingly. So my network costs are still, this is a little counterintuitive, but it, it is correct. I mean, if you think about it, just try to visualize the idea. Basically, what I'm saying is networking will become cheaper, but not as fast as cheap as Moore's law. And because of that, anything that where any, any system in which I save from Moore's law, but I, I cost in, Niels, in network law will will diminish its opportunity to reverse. So if I have a rule that says, hey, you have to be compute intensive enough. Uh, so in the future, I'll have to be even more compute intensive. I have to require even more CPU cycles to make, it, to make my savings large enough to offset the networking costs. Yes, sir? So the few things you're ignoring, uh, yeah, that's perfectly right. Yeah. yeah, I'm ignoring a lot of things. This is, uh, yeah. I mean, this is a rather naive analysis, because Moore's law is not working in terms, not doing parallel, it's doing multi-cores, right? And if you don't have a perfectly 
really get the scaling that you want on the, on, on the compute and this is highly parallel. So that's the first thing. Second, the cost for this is cost per non-redundant bit. If you do any kind of compression, any kind of information compression, which all the ISPs do today, you actually are looking at the per bit cost being much lower because you only have to transfer non-redundant bits. Most bits being transmitted are actually redundant. They're mostly zeros or ones. Yes, yes. This is, uh, both of these, so you can keep one bit of zero and one bit of one, and then just the distribution of what you actually have. <laughs> uh, no, but this is an excellent point. But I think if you're all watching the same YouTube video, then you have a local cache. Absolutely. So, so both of these have a lot more structure to it, so this analysis is rather naive, and I, I'm not inclined to believe it at all. And I suggest you're not, because this is the next slide telling you that. that so the whole point of this initial analysis was to give you an intuition into this idea that what compute cycles give you, what you save, and what you pay. This, this was all. And to give you an intuition that sometimes you have to look at the larger profile of an app. Uh, but what you're saying is perfectly valid. And you can do DDoP, and you can do all kinds of other, you can make all kinds of other assumptions that, that, that and, and, and one assumption right now that I made, which most of the times is probably incorrect, is that all the data you have to move into the cloud when you need to compute and bring it back. The single client, single server model which uh, is not the case in reality. In reality, what you have, and yes, I'm a liar, liar. In reality, what you have is the application owner is not the sole client for its application. In, in reality, because if that were to be the case, the application owner will constantly have, would have to pay for it, this traffic in and out of the cloud and all that. In reality, what happens is the application owner outsources an app into the cloud. I'm a small startup. I'm putting my app into the cloud. And now the cloud acts as the host for my app. But guess what? The cloud has preferential network deals. And the cloud charges hundreds of picocents for inbound traffic, or none. But that none is not really true, because it's masked by other service costs that you have. But charges much less than me, because of preferential network deals. So now suddenly, what happens is all this traffic that otherwise I would have had to pay for if the clients to this app would come to me, I would have to pay thousands of picosens because I don't have preferential deals with Verizon. I don't have critical mass of traffic to be able to get these deals. All this traffic that comes to me will, will, char will charge me, will make me have to pay thousands of picosens. Whereas if I put all this stuff in the cloud, uh, I'm going to only pay a few hundred picosens. So what, what the conclusion of this slide is that in addition to all the stuff you have mentioned and the apps and all this other cool stuff, it's almost always worth to go to the cloud just because the cloud acts as a glorified CDN, a glorified content distribution network, like your caching example. So the, the main reason you want to go to the cloud is not because you save on CPU cycles, not because you, there may be other reasons, but not because you save on CPU cycles, but rather that you're saving on networking, that your app is highly connected somewhere and your traffic is very, very cheap. This is one of the main quantifiable reasons you want to go, in addition to golf buddies and apps that you otherwise wouldn't have and things like that. All right, so, so this, is, this is what I wanted to convey in this talk. Uh, in fact, the interesting thing is, and, and this is very difficult to visualize, so I, I'm just, just ignore the slide, but just what I want to say here is that, in fact, if the CPU cycles were to be 100 times more expensive than at, at home, but networking would still be cheaper in the cloud, it would still be worth it to go to the cloud. If you would have a very expensive cloud, it charge you a buck an hour, but uh, traffic would be 100 picocents, and you have a normal app, a nominal case app, uh, most of the apps would make it worth it to save those thousands of picocents per incoming bit. Okay? So even if, if a cloud would be very expensive, uh, you know, five bucks an hour, it still would be worth it if you have anything that's not highly compute intensive uh, and has some I.O. All right, cool. Let's move on. We're going to the second part of this. Oh, by the way, uh, well, no, this, all of this stuff we don't have time to talk about. But, but, but before we move on, what we started doing, and, and I kind of, I'm not doing research right now for a couple of years, but what we started doing and we thought was very interesting is we started quantifying constants in things. We started looking at the B tree and saying, hey, man, can I make this B tree run at $30, $30 instead of 100 bucks over a number of transactions? Can I make a B tree run much cheaper? And I can reason about this B tree right now because I understand these constants, I understand these costs, I know how much a, this C costs me in actual dollars, I know how much storing memory costs me, 
powered up at certain latency. I know how much disk costs me, disk access, all these things. And then it turns out that you can redesign data structures for constants and stay away from asymptotics. Because asymptotics, very often, by neglecting the constants, don't give you the, the full picture. So you can, you can get an O n log n uh, structure, but then the constants will never make that relevant. What, what's more relevant is the fact that the constants are huge. And the same thing we have in all kinds of crypto protocols. Um, I, ca I can get into more details offline on this, but we had a bunch of ideas of what to do. One of them was we redesigned a B3 and is running at like 40% cost, literally. You take a normal B3 and we redesign a B3 that uses the underlying disk differently. And by using the underlying disk differently, you can become much cheaper and so on and so forth. All right, and then there's all kinds of crypto stuff. All right, this, this is fun, but uh, let's move on. So, uh, so this was the cloud part of the talk. Um, here's, here's, another, here's another cool thing here. Some stuff I've done with a friend of mine, uh, Don Porter, and all these other uh, gentlemen, Basim, Connor, Surya, and myself. And so what is, and this is a Dartmouth, of course, I'm an idiot, I apologize uh, in, uh, in advance, I will buy coffee for everyone. Um, what we did here is we tried to, we built a system, we took OpenStack, which is a cloud platform, and we looked at the following problem. The problem is, in clouds today, and there's a lot of papers in the security community, in clouds today, you, have, you need to have co-location to get cheap cycles and to get sh shared resources. When you share, as soon as you share resources, you start having what is called side channels. These virtual machines that run on the same hardware can communicate between each other and can monitor each other and basically literally suck bits out of each other. If a web server runs in one VM and I can co-locate myself with my competitor's VM on the same host, I can understand all kinds of crypto uh, primitives and all kinds of credentials that this web server runs. For example, I can start leaking bits of the private key that the web server uses for SSL connections. Or I can find out, I can understand the workload on this machine. I can do all kinds of stuff that has to do with side channels. And the question is, well, what do we do with that? And, and the answer is, well, we can always either stay completely away from sharing or build systems that have these, and there's a bunch of papers out there right now, and there's been papers on this since the 70s, build systems that just schedule things in fixed quanta of time and you just get some sort of round robin fixed scheduling situations so you eliminate certain time channels or completely flush caches and eliminate cache based channels. You do all kinds of tricks like that. Or we can think a little bit broader. And what we try to do here is to think a little broader and, and, and our scenario is the following. You have two companies that are competing and they live in the cloud. And I have not done these slides, um, so I have a little bit of a problem with, with these two guys being the fairy tale uh, lady and the worker on the, um, anyway, never mind. And so we have a cloud and we have this co-location problem. And so what we did is we looked at whether we can transparently make the cloud react and eliminate side channels as they come. And so basically what this thing does is the following. You have virtual machines in the cloud. You have a workload. You have Hadoop. You want to run your Hadoop in the cloud. And your competitor will also run Hadoop in the cloud. This is not specific to Hadoop. This is uh, application agnostic, but I'm just giving you an example. And now you have a bunch of tasks as part of these Hadoop jobs. And at some point, some of these tasks may end up running on the same physical host. Everything is fine. As soon as one of the tasks starts touching some sensitive data, and by sensitive here, we mean SE Linux labels and data that's labeled with some security labels. They say, hey, this data is sensitive. The cloud automatically looks at the policy in the hypervisor level, introspects at runtime, in real time, inside the VM, and sees, oh, I just touched the sensitive byte. This VM, the, pol the policy in the cloud or in this particular host says that anything that runs this label cannot coexist with anything that runs this other label. So I may, I'm, I'm just gonna be able to take one of the actions that we have, and one of the main actions that we suggest is I'm gonna migrate this, I'm gonna stop one of the VMs, and I'm gonna on demand migrate one of the VMs somewhere else, transparently. I'm gonna move the security context, I'm gonna move uh, IP addresses, everything else. This VM, within a few seconds, migrate somewhere else, and keep in mind, I don't have to transfer the whole eight gigabytes to start uh, here. I can just transfer the active pages 
and I can do uh, active migration. So I don't need to, don't, don't think of, oh, this is going to take a long time because you have to transfer 8 gigs of RAM, whatever that VM runs. No, I, I am fine with transferring about 20 pages of RAM, and then I, I'm able to start and, and, and fetching everything else on demand. And so this is exactly what we did. We have a cloud infrastructure that has all these policy uh, managers running inside transparently. And then all I have to say is every time I see a VM that touches this label or this other label, the hypervisor automatically at runtime can do an, an action. And most of the actions will be migrate this VM somewhere else. So eliminate any side channels you don't like. So and our policy tool allows you to write these things. You say, OK, I don't want this label to coexist with this label. And all I need to do from now on is to label the right data the right, the right way. And the cloud automatically reacts and migrates things around. All right, so this is what we built. Frankly, I don't think there's a lot of research here. Um, but uh, in the sense that, OK, we did this fine. We published it great. I don't know where this could go. I mean, it's a technical. It was fun to build. We built this in OpenStack. It actually runs. We, the cool thing was uh, an introspection mechanism that is uh, roughly 50. Actually, I don't, I don't want to say nonsense here. Let me just tell you how fast. So the, the coolest thing here was the ability to introspect, um, yes, to introspect about uh, 50 times faster than any existing mechanism, libvirt and libvmi, and we're much, much faster because we took a bunch of assembler that we wrote and we put it straight inside, inside the hypervisor deep in the memory allocator, and we introspect in real time. Um, so that, that was one of the cool things here. But anything else, I'm not sure where this could go. And since I'm not doing too much research now, I'm not going to continue this. But this was something fun that we did, and it actually runs and it builds. Yes, sir? Yeah, how do you know that the data is enabled? That's an excellent point. So if the clients don't have the incentives to, to label their data appropriately. Sure, but the attacker has the incentive not to label the data. Yes, but the client can have a, a, the client can have a policy saying, I don't want to run with any unlabeled data, period. I mean, uh, your introspection gives everything. So your introspection says, hey, here's some stuff that's not labeled. You want to you run, run or not? Uh, it's not, uh, um, but that's a good point. That's an excellent point. So, uh, so you forget whether or not the entity is labeled. Suppose I'm, I'm an attacker. I can label my data saying you know, this is you know, sensitive data. And my policy says, well, OK, I can you know, run at this, the same host as some sensitive data. <coughs> yes. So, so it doesn't matter whether Well, it also depends on the namespaces that you allow. So you can, the cloud can enforce namespaces for different, for different companies. So if, if you are from company A and start running a namespace that doesn't belong to you, the cloud can just stop you automatically. So you have to have, you know, the labeling has to work. Moreover, here, the more interesting case is where you have one company that has incentives to do this. For example, Wall Street. We started with Wall Street. So on Wall Street, you have Moody's, for example. This came out of a discussion with, my, with a friend of mine who's working for Moody's. And she, they have these regulations in Moody's where the, the, the people that charge companies fees cannot talk to the people that do the ratings. In practice, that's bullshit because they talk all the time. And in fact, the ratings are a direct function of the fees. But that, in theory, is not happening. So then they have to put in place mechanisms that in, enforce this type of Chinese wall type of stuff. And so this is basically a, a implementation of Chinese wall. That would be, this would be a perfect shoe-in for Chinese wall. Then you have a company that has this, these incentives and the labels in place, and there's no competing interest. But you can apply this also in a public cloud. You just Although have to be more careful. In practice, if I'm saying I can only uh, co-locate with other VMs from my same company that don't have a lot of the benefits from being in the cloud in the first place. No, no, but in, in that case, Moody's were to have an internal cloud, but they have three or four users of this cloud. They have department, the department that charges, the rating department, they have the risk department, they have like three or four departments. And these departments can only talk in certain configurations. Uh, so they, they get the benefits of having some private cloud. And, but on the other hand, when they share this infrastructure, right now they're not sharing it. Right now they have their own little thing. So the question is, well, can they share it and still be regularly compliant? And this would allow them to do that. But that, those are excellent questions. I mean, obviously. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so that I'm just curious, it, it makes perfect sense when there's a global policy when there are multiple participants and the global policy is sound and, and, and makes sense. Yes. And you can adhere to this policy very efficiently. 
And is there any work on having these policies kind of discovered? Because it, apparently it's oh, not that's when every client says, this is my policy. Yeah. But because you're adhering to a global policy that kind of talk about conflicts. And it cannot be just adhering to everybody what everybody says. Yeah. Does this it make sense in the situation that you... Yes, 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 yes. That you describe because it's a, a top-down imposed policy on the yes. clients. Not every client declaring... Yeah, this is an excellent... I, yes, let's do it. Okay, okay. So that, that's not but just to clarify, what we offer a little bit more than just one global policy. Every VM can come with its own policy. There, there is a global cloud policy, and every client that owns a bunch of VMs can have another per client policy, per administrative account policy. So there is a layer of policying that you can do, including each individual VM instance. When you start an image, you can say, I want this policy on this image. So, so you have a, quite a bit of flexibility. Uh, frankly, we, we thought it's fun to build this. Um, all this smart policy reasoning, we're not smart enough to do it. So it would be fun to do it if, if somebody wants to do it. Uh, we, we didn't have time to look into that. But we built this stuff, and it was actually pretty cool. We, we had to modify kernels, hypervisors, migration mechanisms. It was a lot of fun, uh, but mainly um, the building was exciting to us. All right. There's no saving. Um, this is ju we're just enforcing a secu uh, some security invariant that says. Oh, we're not innovating too much there. All we're saying is, when you do migration, you don't have to download the whole eight gigs so this somewhere is else. The saving coming from just going to active pages only. And yes, yes. Yeah, you can just draw active pages, start running, and bring everything else on demand. And this is, we haven't invented this. This existed in Zen before. We just, we just moved it to KVM. And I think it was also existing KVM. And then we, we modified a couple of things to make this a little faster. But this is not our innovation. Yeah, yeah. But this, but, but this is cool. I mean, this, because most people, when we gave this talk before, people are like, well, yeah, but it's going to take you forever to migrate. It's going to be transparent and so on. And the answer is no, it's, it can be done transparently. And also the security context, moving the security context was not trivial because OpenStack doesn't have that automatically. So it's, you have to move IP addresses, you have to move security context, you have to move firewall rules, all this stuff. And some configurations, frankly, don't work. For example, if you're in different clusters, um, there's all kinds of, if you set up your cloud in the wrong way, but, but, uh, but you don't need to expose that to the client. So that's, you set it up the right way and then things work fine. Uh, do I want to save this? No, I don't want to save this. Let me tell, tell you about something else. Yes, sir. I did a very bad job explaining this, and your question is very justified in that context. Um, the introspection mechanism looks at the SE Linux, secure Linux labels that the processes run, that the processes have that start running in these VMs. So these SE Linux labels come as part of the standard latest Linux kernels, and you have the ability to enable this SE Linux story. And this SE Linux story starts a new universe where everything is labeled. All the, all the little objects, everything that lives there, uh, active things, data, all, everything you can, including sockets, files, blah, 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 are labeled with these labels. And now the introspection module goes straight into the kernel and finds the labels of these, in particular of these processes. We have the option to also find stuff from TCP sockets and other things. We haven't done that. We're basically looking at the labels of the stuff that runs. And we're providing that to the policy engine underneath in real time. We're saying, hey, there's a process that started with this label. We're not detecting behavioral things of the process itself. We don't know what the process does. All we know is that this process said, hey, I am top secret. When I run, I want this VM to be protected beyond normal. And so now I'm expecting whoever deals with this protection to know what to do as long as I label my. So all I have to do is label my process top secret. And from that on, the cloud should take care of everything else. But your question is a very good question in the sense that 
can we do more? Can we observe in real time whether these things do some, even if they're not labeled, and things like that? Or, we haven't done that. There, there is a. Um, there are no pre-existing databases. Yes. So, so the cloud doesn't need to have access to the database of labels. That database, the, the labels come with the policy. So the policy itself says, the cloud doesn't need to know all the labels in the world. The cloud doesn't need to know anything. The policy, the policy it's an XML file that says, here's the namespace, here's the labels that I care about. If you see any of these labels, do this. That's it. And if you, or if you don't see these labels, do that, or whatever. Migrate, if you see this combination of labels, migrate both or stop one and run this until it finishes, then continue that, or change the firewall rules for that. So the, the cloud doesn't need to know labels, doesn't need, all this stuff comes as part of the policy. If there is a cloud-wide policy that has a, a SE Linux label a database with it, it's fine. But right now, these labels are in an XML file, and you're just basically specifying, this is the namespace, this is the labels that I care about, do this when you see these labels. And maybe we can take some of this also offline. But these are excellent questions. I mean, I may even be wrong. I can ask some of my students if I'm wrong. But, but there's no, the XML files, the, the policy files contain the labels. And it's kind of exclusive. But we're not, we don't need to know all the labels in the universe. Does that even briefly answer your question? And if not, let's, we'll, we'll take it offline. It helps a bit. All right, all right. Let's, let's, let's talk more offline on that. Uh, don't hesitate to ask more questions. Um, all right, so here, okay, so here, this is, uh, my student is graduating. He decided to join my startup, so he's not on the market anymore. But before that, he was preparing to give job talks, and this is his job talk. And this is a bunch of stuff we've been doing together, mostly him. I mean, he's, he's a smart guy. I have no clue what, what he's doing here. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of this stuff. So here's, here's some of the stuff uh, he has been working on. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of these that I find uh, a little bit strange. So, and more interesting, I mean, more, more interesting. So he's been working in the general idea of regulatory compliance, okay? So we have this idea of regulatory compliance. We have a bunch of rules. We have about 12,000 regulations. And all these regulations say what you can, can or cannot do with pieces of data. And, and some of these regulations are actually pretty difficult to enforce. And so we started building systems that allow you to do this. Uh, and this is a nice area because it lives at the intersection of you need to have strong security, strong security properties, and so on. But you actually have to have also data and build systems that enforce this. So it's not uh, fully theoretical, but you, you better have some decent security. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not just engineering. So it's, a, it's an interesting intersection. And so he has built things like history-independent file systems. I'll tell you a little bit about that. He has built a, a trusted database that runs on trusted hardware. He has built, uh, we have built correct, correct databases that enforce query authentication. Uh, we have built this new concept of untraceable deletion, basically a relational database that lives in a universe where things can disappear forever as if they never existed. So you can, a database that constructs parallel universes, and I'll tell you why that is interesting. And, and now we're working on you know, flash storage and, and all kinds of things in this arena. So let me tell you a little bit about, so in data, database outsourcing, again, we're in the cloud. And now the problem is we, we don't trust this cloud. We want all kinds of cool things from this cloud, right? We want data integrity, query correctness, confidentiality, query privacy, access privacy. We want all kinds of things from this cloud, all kinds of guarantees, some sort of security policies, or whether we call them security or not, doesn't matter. We want this, this, some properties that, that the cloud has to give us. And one of these main properties is, has to do with correctness and confidentiality. We want to run queries with full confidentiality in the cloud. And the second uh, thing we may want is we want correctness. We want full correctness. We want, and what is correctness in this sense? Well, sure, it could be also verifying a, a Mac on a tuple, but it, it entails more of the query level uh, completeness and co uh, correct execution. I want to know that my query was correctly executed there, and these results are 
without having to redo the query, obviously, at the client side, right? So TrustedDB and CorrectDB are two examples of that. And what we did here is in our research is we deployed trusted hardware to build these databases. And TrustedDB is one of the first things we did. And so basically what we did is, let me go straight to the point, is we took a query processor, we took uh, MySQL, and we basically split the database in two. Every time a query comes in, a query processor looks at it and says, hey, does this query, which portions of this query touch uh, security sensitive attributes, pieces of data that the server should not know about, or the server can't know about because it can't decrypt them. So I have a database, parts of it is encrypted, social security numbers, phone numbers, uh, health records, whatever, whatever you wanna have encrypted, and I'm getting a query, and I want to make this fully transparent for the client. I want the client to just say, select star from blah, where blah, and the result should come out even though parts of this are encrypted on the server, and only the client knows the decryption key. And so what we do here is we take a query, we split it into two parts, security sensitive part, uh, uh, non-security sensitive part, we run as much as possible. We, we have a query uh, a cost analyzer that runs as much as possible of this query outside of this trusted hardware, and anything else we can't run outside, we send straight to a secure coprocessor and run it inside. And then we aggregate things back, we sign things, we encrypt things, we, uh, uh, um, we coalesce the query, and we send it back to the client. The client has no clue what just happened. And this is fully transparent. So this was, a, I think, a, I don't remember, I think it was a Sigma or VLDB paper a couple of years ago. And so this is, this is what TrustedDB does. And let me just give you an example. Wait, I'm not gonna give you an example. I'm gonna give you an example a little later. Now what does CorrectDB do? CorrectDB says, hey, we, we want query authentication. And query authentication is terribly difficult to achieve if you truly want to do it securely and you wanna do it for arbitrary queries. Of course, you can do query authentication for simple things like select star from table where uh, you know, salary greater than this, uh, order by. And I mean, it's not trivial to do it, and obviously there's been a lot of ICD, VLDB, Sigma papers on this, but ultimately you always boil down to, hey, we'll build a Merkle hash on some results, or we'll have uh, some incremental signature that signs all these tuples that we got, a chunk of tuples, and then, I, was it something I said? Are you leaving because of something I said? Um, so we get, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, so you get a, a chunk of tuples and you sign all of these together and then you verify the signature at the client and at the client you also get this verification object and the verification object somehow magically allows you to not having to have access to the whole data but still be able to verify stuff. Just think of Merkle trees. And if you don't remember Merkle trees, the Merkle trees is this idea of being able to sign a very large set and be able to test whether an element belonged to that set only in log in in some login work, communication or uh, communication computation. So uh, without having the set. Okay, so this, this is what people have been doing. But the question is, well, but what, what happens when you have nested queries? What happens when you don't have these indexes built? What happens when you don't have these signatures built over? What if you have select star from some other view and then there's, another, there's all kinds of nesting happening and you don't have any indexes, you don't have any signatures, you don't have any way to produce these verification objects? And so the answer is, well, it becomes very, very expensive. And you see papers such as you know, CryptDB or other software-only approaches that claim to do full SQL, but when you actually go down to the bottom of it and you have any TPCH or any kind of more meaningful query, things can become tremendously expensive, tremendously expensive. You have to transfer back the entire database several times back and forth. It's just tremendously expensive. So we thought of, well, can we prove that we can do things better? And we basically prove in CorrectDB that if you deploy trusted hardware, you can do things significantly better, even though trusted hardware is 10 times uh, slower than normal hardware. So that's basically what we do. CorrectDB, we show that for almost all scenarios, actually for all scenarios with the latest model of the hardware, even the hardware is uh, 150 times more expensive at 10 times slower, by having it near to the data, you can do things much, much better than any software-based approach. So that, that's basically correct DB. Um, I'm just gonna ignore all the other slides. 
Let me tell you about HIFS. So you see, you get two for the price of one. Actually, five for the price of one. You get, instead of one good talk, you get five mediocre talks. This is what happens here. So what is HIFS? We have uh, 14 minutes. HIFS, history independence, regulatory compliance. John goes to the hospital. Unfortunately, John has HIV. He goes to the hospital. The hospital keeps a record. Six months later, the hospital has to shred the record. Maybe. Let's say there's a regulation that says that. How do we deal with this securely? Well, one answer, Dan Bonet's answer, is, and I completely forgot to, I have to do something. Yes, OK. Can you remind me Dan Bonet? Thank you. OK, so one answer is, take, encrypt everything, and when things expire, just throw away the key. That's fine. That's fine. That works. As long as you assume that that encryption will never be broken, and let's assume that S-boxes and AES will be strong enough in 100 years, nobody's going to break AES, and it's fine. But what happens to any side effects that had to do with the fact that John was in a hospital? One such side effect, for example, appears in a B tree, in an index. Any data structure that managed some state about John's existence, unless it's designed to be history independent, offers an oracle to the following question. Was John ever in this hospital? The B tree will look different depending on whether John was there or not. Even though the current data of the, the B tree does not contain John. I deleted the John from this B tree. But the B tree itself will look very different depending on whether you inserted John there first and the, the, done all kinds of other stuff and then removed John or whether John was never there. So the B tree offers you surprisingly accurate ability to answer whether John was in this hospital, even though you have deleted John's record, you have deleted John's records from the B tree, you have deleted everything. But now the system itself, there's state across all these layers that allows you pretty easily sometimes, much better than coin flip, to figure out whether John had HIV and is in a hospital, was in a hospital with HIV. So what do we do about it? Can we do, so? is there something we can do about it? Well, it turns out that yes, so we had some fun with this. So this is, uh, so one of the first things we did is to say, okay, well, let's build a history independent file system. What is a history independent file system? Well, it turns out we, now we built a whole theory, and this is to me its thesis now, which has become very complicated and actually pretty elegant and beautiful, but I, I don't have time to talk about it. So basically just, I'm just gonna ignore all of that and just leave you with this intuition of the index. What a history independent file system does is it says, hey, as long as you only look, hey, oh, and by the way, before we move forward, just remember, there's this in intuition about universal history independence. If you go all the way to, to quantum level and beyond, I'm gonna bullshit a little bit here, but this is fun, just listen. Quantum level, string theory, things like that. Is there something that, is there true history independence in the world? And my answer would be that maybe not. Maybe everything we do impacts at some level. We get to some quantum level, we get somewhere where some impact of my shouting right now vibrates that window that generates a couple more photons spread out somewhere in the universe that, that entangle with something else and that, that I have no control, I have no way to control it unless I'm God. And so, okay, okay, I see some people smiling, but no, but this is, I mean, this is, this is important because we came across this by realizing that, hey, it's not sufficient to, to solve one file system layer. How, we, we need to solve the memory allocator in Linux, in the Linux kernel. Oh, and by the way, we need to solve the hardware, any hardware state. And oh, by the way, there's a networking card there. We, the networking card may have state about John's having HIV. Some register may. So if you really want to have strong security, and this is always the, the you know, if you want to have strong, have a, write a security proof, it turns out you cannot write a security proof unless you stop somewhere and say, there is no state in the hardware and everything else on top matters, but at some point I need to stop. And that, that's where this discussion with quantum level history independence came from. So if I move, if I move a bit around anywhere in some electromagnetic fashion, I have an, my feeling is that somewhere in the universe something will entangle with this and I can't have universal history independence. Okay, I got seven more minutes. So let's move back to HIFS. What, what is difficult here? Let me try to find a more interesting slide here for you. Uh, hum, 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 hum. No. All right, well, I don't have an interesting slide. Uh, I have a, a million slides, but we don't have time. So basically the, the, the difficult part here is the following, right? If you were to write a, straw man's history independent file system, how would you do it? Well, the stupidest thing one could do, but something that works, 
is, well, every time, every time I delete something, I'm just going to reorder all these blocks. I'm going to rewrite an index in some canonical form. All my inodes, I'm going to redo my inodes at file system level or any level I want. I'm just going to cano canonical form them. The problem is that's obviously not working, right? Because I want to have data locality. I want to have caching. I want to be able to run a file system with some latency guarantees. So I can't constantly do a million disk seeks for every one, disk, for every one block that I have to delete. So the question is, well, can we do something better? And that's what HIFS achieves. Okay, the, the, the idea here is we, we built an entire file system in the kernel. It's not, well, we built also Fuse variant, but I don't remember if the latest is a kernel or a Fuse. But we built the whole file system. And this file system, the cool thing about it is that it still preserves some data locality performance-wise, but it, it provably does not offer any history. It does not leak any history about what happened from on top. So I can write files, I can delete files, and so I can prove to you that, and we have security proofs for it, that you don't leak any history, but I'm much more efficient than always going back to the canonical form. In fact, we prove now that you don't need canonical forms for certain types of history independent. For if you just want to protect deletions, you don't need to go back to canonical form. You just have to prevent someone from figuring out the deletions. So you, you, have, you just have to have indistinguishability in terms of deletions in the past, and so on and so forth. So this is just a wishy-washy description of high, uh, HIFS. But if you, I'm giving you a flavor of this. And if you're interested, let's read the papers, and we can talk if, you, if you're interested. There's much more to do here. So but again, what HIFS does is it allows you to build history independence in the file system layer while still preserving data locality and being much more efficient than doing just canonical forms all the time. So we built a history independent uh, data structure that is much more efficient at file system level. All right, I got five more minutes. Let me tell you about Ficklebase, and then we're done. Wait, this VM window here is open? What's, what's up with this? OK, good. So Ficklebase, what is Ficklebase? Well, here's another thing about secure deletion. Um, We discussed about John, HIV, structure, and a B3 index. Great. What about the fact that you go to a database, and John is in there, and now we're computing the average ages of all the people in the database that have HIV. And I get a number, let's say 40. And then John has to be deleted. It turns out that John was the one patient that was skewing that number, number 40, uh, to a such an extent that in the future, if John is not there, but I see the average age still being listed as 40. Some transaction depended on John's data. And currently, this data does not match the current patient records. And suddenly, I have another ability, another oracle, for the question, was John here? Or was a patient that had a very high age, for example, here in this database? So, the, so, so now the question is, well, can we build a database that has this ability to go retroactive and expire some record and expire any and all effects of this record from anything else that appears in the database, both semantics and structure. So we want true full, full history independence. And some of you may ask, well, that's utopia. That's actually useless because very often I I can't roll back all my transactions throughout. I mean, one stupid implementation would be, let's roll back everything. Like, let's keep track of everything we've done and constantly roll back things. And so as soon as I John uh, del got deleted, I keep a track of all the transactions that impacted John. And then I'm going to go and roll all of them back. But if you actually take this a little further, you realize this is bringing you nowhere. And your database will be extremely inefficient. Yeah, well, what we built is, and I think this was VLDB last year or ICD, uh, we, we built a database that does something completely different. A database that maintains universes, chunks of universes, slices of universes, in which I maintain, you, for, for each thing that I'm going to expire in the future. And I'm going to have, at the same time, maintain the universe in which John does not exist, and another universe in, in which John does exist. And I'm going to maintain them at the same time. And at some point when John has to disappear, I'm just going to drop one of the universes out of the, out of the world, the one where John exists. I'm, I'm just going to throw out the entire universe. 
But because I maintain this other universe separately from the first one, completely separately, none of the transactions here, none of the data, none of the semantics are impacted by John's existence, which was appearing only in the second universe. So I threw away John's existence completely. And I'm just maintaining this universe going from the point forward from the point of John expiring. And now, of course, you're going to ask me, well, are you crazy? I mean, this is tremendously expensive. How can you implicitly, this seems to suggest that every time I need to get a new item that I have to expire at some point, I have to create a new universe and run a new query for that. And if you were to look at it that way, it seems very expensive. Well, it turns out that we figured out a way to, run, to build these universes and maintain them in real time with almost no overhead by using some sort of you know, dynamic programming-alike mechanism. So in other words, view these universes as actual some sort of notion of views minus John being in there. And you can maintain an arbitrary number of these. Not arbitrary. There is an overhead. There's about 1% overhead per, per universe maintained. So we can maintain you know, several tens, hundreds of expiration epochs. But each of these things is actually very efficiently maintained by using deltas from these universes. So I only actually really want run one query. And I, I, don't have to inc I don't incur extra overhead, significant extra overhead, up, up to 1% overhead for every new universe I create. So we first thought of how, what we want. And then we went about building it very, very efficiently. And all of this stuff is actually run. There's a database. You can download it. You can run it. And uh, basically, what this database offers you is the ability to maintain full secure deletion and erase any traces of stuff you do, do not want to have been there in the first place. So do you need to know at the time the data is added that you will want to securely delete it? Yes, yes, yes. That's an excellent point. That's a good observation. So uh, all these things have expiration times. They come with a policy. John entered the hospital. Or John, you know, in six, this record has a six months retention period. In six months, this will expire. So I need to know. Well, I don't need to know. I can keep maintaining. Actually, there's a subtle point here. I can keep maintaining the universe. If I don't want to delete it, nobody's forcing me to delete it. That universe is linked to John's existence. If I want to prolong John's, if the law changes and says, hey, the six months have become 12, I can keep maintaining that. I can string it along for 12 months. But in but right now, I'm starting a new universe for all this, any new stuff I need to expire. And ideally, for efficiency, I want these new things to be batched together. So I want to have a bunch of records that expire in six months instead of one record expiring every other day kind of stuff. But the cool thing here is that the overheads are very small. And this ability to maintain these parallel universes efficiently is, is working. And this is transparent also. So you. At the client side, all you have is expiration times on tuples. And that's it. You don't see these things. And later, you run, suddenly run a query uh, a, a few months, uh, you know, a day later after expiration. Your query will return as if nothing else has happened. But the results will not reflect John's existence, including more, most essentially not the John's name and data and social security number. That, of course, we delete, including any and all side effects that John's existence may have had in that database. The fact that John's data was used in an average computation or in some select clause that resulted in some other table being filled with some other data, whatever, whatever John's side effects or you know, existence impacted, those disappear. They don't, they're not there. You can couple this with HIFS, and we built a way to couple it. Uh, that's an excellent point. If you go below at memory allocation level and SSD level, if you're running an SSD, again, you lose it. And now we're building an SSD, a file system history independence for SSDs. And we're rewriting firmware for an SSD to do it history independence, which turns out to be quite difficult. Yes, sir, you had a question, and I'm out of time. So floor is open, and I, I could talk for hours. So I'm just going to stop. Just thank you. Yeah. Thank you. If you have a query that touches and data items, then you would have to create an explanation number of universes in the data items. 
No, that's the, that's the secret. All you care about is the new thing that you bring in that has to expire. One data item that later will be used in a query. So we are operating at the point of you inserting a data object with an expiration time in the database. That's when you create the universe, not when this object starts to be used in other queries that touch other objects and so on. And from that point on, anything that this object touches will touch it only in the universe corresponding to this object. And in the other universes, you also maintain, but this query will not be run with this object. If this object's data were to impact, they will not impact in the other universes. It's a little more, it's more elegant, but it's maybe a little more difficult to, to explain in two minutes. But we can look at the paper. Yeah, you could keep the universe around. I'm not saying you change the expiration. Yeah, but if your question was, can I change the expiration date? Is that if you maintain the foundation of the system? Yeah, if you maintain I was trying to address this point. There may be a slight subtle difference between what I suggested and what your question was. My point was that nobody's stopping you to keep this universe around longer. Because this universe is not tied it's tied to the existence of John. It's not tied really to an expiration time. The expiration time just makes it disappear at that point. But this universe is tied to John. So if you want to keep John around, you could keep this universe around. There's a 1% chance I may say something stupid. I've been known to say stupid things before. So, but I'm pretty sure that I'm correct. You can keep this universe around. Uh, but we can, if you're interested, we could you know, read the paper and take it offline. But now you put pressure on them. What if nobody's going to show? I'm going to feel like really bad. And then they will feel pressure to come and we'll just sit there and sleep. So <laughs> in Purdue, we had this seminar where they made all the grad students go to see this. Yeah, yeah, OK. No, but some of us like to go because it was fun to make fun of people. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least you. All right, so if you like some of this stuff, uh, email me or something. We can, we can do something fun. I'm not doing much research now, but I have a bunch of students and postdocs and stuff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.